Good morning, everybody, and to Ohio Gesimas. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Jean Myers as our today's speaker, who will talk about what's image-based systems biology and more. You know, you may not know the name Jean Myers, but you definitely know of Jean Myers' work because he's one of the pioneers in bioinformatics. He was the driving force in developing BLAST, a technology that has led to the first full sequence of the human genome uh, mediated by the shotgun method. And he did that when he was working as a vice president at Celera that was headed by Craig Venter, another name you probably have heard before. And uh, with the help of this method, there was a factor 10 less cost and higher speed of accomplishing the sequencing of the human genome. And I was particularly pleased to see that if you want that a free spirit can do it much cheaper than a humongous uh, public program that has been led at that time by Collins at the NIH. So it just tells you something about creativity and public funding. <laughs> now, Gene has made a stellar career. He has been a faculty member at the University of uh, California. He then, as I said, was the vice president uh, at Silira. He has subsequently been a faculty member at the University of Berkeley, and then joined the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Genelia Farm in Virginia, close to Washington. And then to my very great pleasure, he accepted a call by the Max Planck Society, where I was president, to come and join the Max Planck Institute for Cell, Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden as a director. And at the same time also, became the director of the Center for Systems Biology in Dresden, where he developed the imaging technology analysis that he is going to talk about. Now, Gene studied math in Caltech. And I read about uh, his studies. He was always a good you know, math student. But he failed in one particular field, and that was the course in rhetoric. He failed because he didn't take that course assuming that he's not a good public speaker. So, Gene, I hope that in the decades that followed that course, <laughs> that you have changed your opinion, that you need good speakers in science, and also your proficiency. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm very happy to have you, and uh, I think we should welcome him with a big hand. Thank you. Uh, is, is the mic on? Can everybody hear me? Yeah? So uh, thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, 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 Peter was a, a great president of the Max Planck Society. I mean, uh, it, the, the society, I think, really developed and became very international under his leadership, and um, um, I, I, it's great to see him here. And, uh, um, and it's, uh, I'm very uh, curious about this place and to see how you all are doing here in, in beautiful Okinawa. So it's my pleasure to be here. Um, so I thought, um, I was told it was supposed to be like a talk for almost everybody. So I, I actually, I changed my mind and decided that I'd start at the beginning. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of pick up the story right after Solera, basically after the sequencing of the human genome. Um, and Peter's right, actually. I mean, you know, I have a tremendous respect for my colleagues in the public sector. I mean, many of them are my friends. And um, it was just simply that, that one nice thing you can do is, is we could take a risk. Uh, when you're spending public money, oftentimes you can't take the same kind of risk you can when it's your own, when it's your own money. Um, so basically, after the genomes were sequenced, um, in about 2002, 2003, I, I was... I was like wondering, well, what am I going to do next, and, and, and why exactly did we do that, right? Because everybody was saying, well, we're going to have the blueprint of life, and we're going to understand everything, right? That's how, we, that's how a lot of people sold it, right? And, of course, that isn't what happened, right? That having the genome was just the beginning. 
But it was the beginning of what? And, and in my mind, what I, what I realized, and this is actually a slide from 2003, 2004, is that if you imagine this line here represents a piece of a genome, so it's meant to represent a, a, a piece of a, a DNA strand, then typically um, what you'll have somewhere on that strand is the encoding for a gene, and that gene basically makes a protein. And typically every, well not typically, every gene basically has uh, typically a, a, a region called a promoter, which I'm showing here, which basically controls whether or not this gene is currently being made in a cell or not. And um, so uh, the, the interesting thing is, is once, you, once you actually have the sequence of the genome, regardless of whether or not you understand what this gene does or exactly where the promoter is, you can, you can make the following uh, manipulation, which had been well known, which is you can take a, a, fluorescent, a, a fluorescent protein, a, a coding for fluorescent protein, and using transgenic techniques, you can make a construct in which you attach or pen the fluorescent protein to the gene. So you basically alter the genome of a little creature, a fly or a worm, whatever you want, and you can basically attach this, this piece of of a DNA sequence that basically codes for gluing fluorescent protein, so that when the protein gets made, the, you actually get the protein plus this kind of a, a label, a, a, a fluorescent label, so you can label the protein. So what that means, very simply, is that you can basically go in and take any gene or any uh, it, it, that's in a genome, whether or not you know what it is or not, and you can label it. You can actually specifically, in some sense, stain it and see it. And, you know, this, you have to realize, I mean, most of you here are young and you're probably like, yeah, sure, do that all the time. I do that every day, right? But the point of the matter is, is until we had the human genome and the genome of the fly, and we had all these things, which was about just 2000, just a little less than 20 years ago, you couldn't do this, right? And this ability has been really, I think, one of the major drivers of the acceleration of molecular biology, at least from my point of view. This has been a huge driver. Um, the other thing, of course, that you can do is, is you can also just replace the gene that codes for the protein with a fluorescent construct so that what happens is, is any cell where this gene is being made makes the fluorescent. So you can tell whether or not the gene is being expressed. So you can make two kinds of easy constructs. And, um, um, and, and these, were, these, are, these were very important uh, advances. And the real, and I think one of the really strong reasons why you need a precise genomic sequences so that you can explain and explore it. And so, and what I saw at the time in about 2003, 2004, I said, oh, well, wait a minute. So we're going to make, we're going to be taking all these pictures of all these glowing molecules on, in all of these microscopes, right? And who's thinking about how to interpret the images? Who's thinking about the informatics, right? I'm a bioinformatician. I'm a technologist. What I like to do is develop software to basically help you interpret your data. And the question was, is bioinformatics, everybody was thinking about graphs and networks and sequences, and nobody was thinking about images, about microscope images, um, which also wasn't possible until we had digital cameras. And so, you know, basically, part of it was actually is, is that I went to Dresden in 2003, and uh, Tony Hyman was there uh, at the Max Planck, and, and basically I saw some of his movies. And, you know, I was, I was pretty, still pretty naive. Well, I'm, I'm always going to be naive about biology, but uh, you know, I saw these pictures. In particular, I saw this one where I saw the glowing tips of EB1 microtubules. So in other words, this is what's stained here is a molecule that adheres to the tip of a, mole of, of a, of a tubule that's growing, and you can, you can you can see this fantastic structure here. You're seeing a, a, a double labeling where uh, there's PAR2 and PAR6, which are the molecules that orient the uh, first division of the worm so that you can so that it knows where to make the tail and, and where to make the head and then here not, not as a, a nice an image but still one that gives you the idea there's the nuclear envelope disappearing the centrosomes forming and so this ability to look at, at things and actually see what's happening at the mesoscale of the cell and also at the level of collections of cells really like fascinated me I mean and so so about 2003 I decided to stop thinking about sequences entirely, okay, left DNA sequencing, and basically said, okay, this is, this is I'm going to try, I'm going to try seeing what I can do here. Um, so, um, and, and so, and, and so the point is, is that you need software to basically interpret all of this, right, to find all of the tracks, 
to basically kind of measure the signal strength of the various things that are going on, to measure the size of the centrosome. And that, none of that software existed uh, some time ago. And so what I really think uh, about the Human Genome Project and all of the genome projects is that they, they didn't really enable systems biology in my view. I mean, in my view, systems biology is still premature. We're just, we're still getting ready for systems biology, okay, <laughs> from what I'm concerned. But what we can do is we can systematically explore the genetics of the genome by basically lighting everything up and looking and seeing what's going on and seeing what's happening. And I, I call that systems genetics, okay, not systems biology. Okay, and there are several examples of this. The first one was basically uh, Aaron O'Shea, uh, I think who's now the president of uh, uh, HHMI, basically built um, uh, basically protein GFP fusions of every single one of the 6,000 genes in yeast and literally made every single one of those and put them under a microscope and took a picture of them, okay? I made a movie of them, you know? And, and the thing is, is that I talked to her and I said, well, you know, how did you analyze those? And she said, well, we looked at them and, and made a, a notation. And I just, you know, as an informatician, I was just dying because I, you know, I realized that there was an incredible amount of information in every one of those movies, right? And I mean, think about the expense of, you know, all those movies too, right? And no, I mean, basically it was expressed in blah, okay? And that was, that was the, the output of all of those images. And then uh, Tony Hyman and Chevery, similarly, basically, this one was very interesting, took every gene in a worm, there are 18,000 genes, and knocked it down with a technique called RNA, I turned it off, each one individually, and then they looked at whether or not a cell was dividing correctly in the first cell division. And they basically, it was very interesting, and that was a big screen, and it basically gave them the 600 genes that were critical for, the my, for, my, for, for mitosis, okay? And then they've been, they've been working with that data set ever since. And the, the one I'm gonna tell you a little bit more was, uh, uh, and that I was involved in more recently was uh, when I was at HHMI, was uh, with Gerald Rubin. Basically, we built promoter GFP fusions. So these are the promoter fusions. Where is the gene being expressed in a fly to get basically fine brain control of every neuron in the fly brain? And I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you about that one. Okay, but you can see these are these are systematic projects where we're basically making lots of these these uh, uh, transgenic fusions and. Like I said, I mean, what I saw back in 2003 is, is that there was going to be this sea of imagery, right? And the bioinformatics world wasn't focused on it, okay? Um, and it's still not completely focused on it. And I can tell you that's because actually the methods for interpreting imagery are quite different than the methods for thinking about graphs or sequences. And oftentimes what happens is somebody who's trained for one doesn't know how to do the other. Um, so it's still kind of an issue, actually. Uh, and so this area of bioimage informatics uh, has arisen. Um, the nice thing, though, is, is that it's not an empty group now. There's, there's I'd say, worldwide, there's two, 300 people that are working on it. But at the time, there was almost nobody doing this. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit then about the, the, the fly brain story. So this is one of these, these systematic genetic stories. And this one I was involved in. And I'm not going to actually tell you about any of the informatics problems that we had to solve. I'm just going to tell you kind of what we found. Kind of was fun about the brain. So this is a, a, a NC82 stained fly brain. So the, basically the stain, there's a, a general stain that's attracted to wherever the neurons like to make a synapse, to make a connection. And so you get this kind of interesting picture. And this is basically the entire, this is not only the brain, but it's actually also the eyes and the, uh, the, the, the spine, the central nervous cord. So, and it's not a very big brain. It's uh, about 30,000 neurons are in the eyes. In fact, there are more neurons in the eyes than there are in one of the core hemispheres, which is the part that actually makes decisions. Okay. Although generally, these neurons are much more complex and articulated than these. And then there's about 10,000 neurons in the ventral nerve cord, which are primarily uh, sensory and then output neurons that are driving the muscles. Okay. So, um, you can look at, so I want to kind of focus in on the core brain. And if you kind of look at that top part then, this is uh, um, from Otsuno and Ito. Um, basically, what they did is they, um, they stained basically the, 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 the synapses in blue, and then the green is actually glial cells. So that's actually, actually those are basically uh, cells that are, are, are covered in fat 
that are basically insulators in some sense. It's like, uh, it's like the, the plastic over coax cable. They, they insulate the, any electrical signals. And what you can see as we kind of fly through this section is there seem to be compartments, right? Notice there, there are areas that are insulated from other areas, okay? And they sat down and they studied this, and at the end of the day, they said, well, there are roughly 50 of these compartments, okay, where, you know, where maybe something's going on. So the idea was just to kind of get a feeling for, like, what's the structure of this thing? And it's very stereotypic. I mean, every fly brain has these 50 regions reproducibly over and over and over again, okay? Um, and so, and then they made a model. Okay, so here's the model. All right, okay. All right, and so we, you know, we develop stuff to look at the model and image the model. Um, um, but here's the, here's the thing that really became fairly fascinating, which kind of developed right around the time 2005, which is just that kind of in a more abstract way. So the, the fly brain is kind of rather weird because basically the, the, here's, the, here's the volume that will be organized into those <coughs> those glial compartments, right? So A, B, C are supposed to be uh, an example of a few of these compartments. The interesting thing is, is that, the, that, the, that the, the nucleus, the stem cell, uh, or the neuroblast, the stem cells that are gonna make the brain are all located on the periphery, okay? And they all, it's, and then they all grow interior. So it's very different than a human brain, right? Just in case you're confused, because human brains, the, the, the cell with the nucleus is in the middle, and then there's a dendrite and there's axon. Uh-uh, not for, not for insects. There's just one primary neurite that goes out, and it's both uh, dendritic and axonal. In other words, it both receives signal and propagates signal, depending, depending upon which part of the neuron it is. So when you look at, and, and, and after a while, after we've been studying these for a while, what we realized is, is that basically um, you, you take one of these, and, and this thing basically, this one of these hemispheres, so kind of that half, half brain of the core brain, is made out of exact, starts from basically 106 progenitor cells. There are 106 stem cells that are going to make the 20,000 cells of the brain. Okay, and if we look at one of these, let's say V1 here, kind of as a, in a cartoon form, what happens is that, that that progenitor basically, through a series of asymmetric divisions, makes basically, every time it, it makes an asymmetric division, it makes something that then makes two neurons, okay? And, there, and those two neurons know that there's, a, there's, a, there's an A lineage and a B lineage, okay? And they know they're different, okay? So it makes kind of two groups of neurons, each of which seem to have a different genetic identity. They have a different state somehow or another. So, you know, this, this thing has a given state and it propagates its state. So it makes two lineages and it maybe makes about 50 of these divisions. So for example, a given neuroblast maybe makes 100 to 200 neurons in these two hemi lineages. And when you look at what these neurons do from one of the hemi lineages, for example, if you see that, for example, this one basically makes some kind of projection Typically what'll happen is it'll very quickly make a, uh, a, an arbor, a little tree-like arbor, into a compartment that's right near where it enters. Okay, and this one basically is primarily um, dendritic in the sense that it basically is an integrator. It's basically feeling its environment. It's seeing whether or not it wants to fire or not, okay? And then basically, the, it, then it goes on, the primary neurite kind of continues, a long tube kind of continues, it's, uh, it's not a very thick tube actually, and basically will maybe perhaps divide once or twice, and then basically enter a couple of other chambers, okay, and create another arbor. And those arbors are primarily uh, uh, axonal, they're primarily propagating a signal and they're tickling the, any, any dendrites that happen to be in that area, okay? Um, now, here's the fascinating thing, is if one of them does that, then probably the one that was born just before does exactly the same thing, okay? And the one after it, okay? And so on and so on, okay? And in fact, you can basically think that each hemilineage basically makes a particular energization pattern. In other words, basically you could describe this entire red hemilineage as saying, it integrates signal from A and propagates it to B and C, okay? 
You, you, could, you get it first blush, okay? It's, it's not, a, as in biology, it's not 100% true. Sometimes these guys switch programs kind of halfway through and do another pattern, but basically there's a repertoire of about, you know, about 200 patterns, okay, that get made of kind of primary integration paths. And then the other interesting thing is, is it's where these guys make the arbors. They tend to spread out. They don't occupy the same space. So it's like, it's like this, this, this kind of this, this set of neurons. What they're doing is they're is they're basically sampling, basically the signals that are taking place in that arbor, right, and then making decisions based on the area, of the of the glial area that's being taken. And to me, this was really incredible. Okay, because the other thing that we discovered, okay, is that it, the brain is incredibly stereotyped. Okay, if you take, for example, take the first one of these and you image it in a brain, and then you take another brain and you image exactly the same one, it will be the primary neurite, the primary neurite will be in the same place to within plus minus one or two microns. Okay, plus minus one or two microns. In other words, okay, and we didn't know this when we started, the fly brain is completely wired, okay? I mean, it's genetically, excuse me, it's completely genetically determined. Right, because you know, we, I thought I uh, I naively thought that stereotypy, like you know, the worm, like Sydney's worm, where basically the cells always have exactly the same fate, that that was a really rare thing. But no, okay, there are other places and other points in developmental trajectory. Now I'm beginning to see many of these, where especially in early development, where the kind of the spatial layout is really important, where stereotypy is a really strong thing. I mean, where the, it's clear the genetic program has the coding potential to do this. So basically, in some sense, this is all good news because it means that really, if we kind of want to have a, a, some understanding of this brain, we just basically kind of need to understand this hypergraph. You know, hemilineage V1A basically integrates from glial compartment A and projects into B and C, right? I mean, that would be already a pretty interesting model, okay? Um, so we know then that the brain is highly stereotyped, and so we basically said, okay, well, given that, then we can basically, with light, with just light microscopy, because there are a lot of a lot of people have been trying to do do neuron mapping with EM microscopy, right? Trying to get every single detail, like they're trying to go into the nanometer level. But in some sense, as long as you can make individual <coughs> neurons glow, okay, you can sparsely label neurons, okay. It, what it says is in the fly brain, you can do a hell of a lot of biology, okay? All right, without going to the, to the, to the problem of figuring out how to do this massive EM uh, 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 modeling. So the first thing that, and, and that Jerry did basically was a massive, what would be called promoter bashing project for those of you that are, uh, uh, do this kind of thing. But basically what we did, um, let me show it to you in this picture, is we took every, we took every um, gene that might have something to do with the brain. Okay, so we didn't take every gene. There are 14,000 genes in Drosophila, but we took, a, a, I think, a collection of 6,000 of them. And for example, this is a receptor. You would expect a receptor to do something in the brain. And what we did basically is, is we basically took little pieces of the region. Uh, so, so this is actually the components of the gene. They're broken into several pieces called exons. And we took basically pieces of the genome between it that, that may or may not be controlling the regulation of that thing. And then we made one of those constructs and then we put it under a microscope and we looked at it. And I mean, look at this, this. you get these beautiful, specifically stained areas. This is called the ellipsoid body. And so this basically, this particular construct, R19H07, basically will reproducibly, okay, give us exactly the neurons on the ellipsoid body, okay? Which is pretty cool. So, and this was just a fishing expedition, right? Which was a mathematician, a little hard for me to understand, but after a while I got it, okay? The idea, and the important thing is, is that when you make these things, you have reproducible access to the same thing, okay? And I, that, that, that's kind of the point of that. So basically, we, we basically did this for, you know, I don't know, I think 8,000 constructs, about 50% of them were interesting. Some of them were uninteresting. Some of them basically the entire brain lit up. Some of them nothing lit up. But about half of them, it was interesting. Some subset of neurons was lit up. Some, and you know, they kind of varied in size. And so, so we built a, you know, so we did, you know, this is just to show that in the background, you know, me and Han Xuan Peng were basically in the boiler room, right, trying to integrate all these things and 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 uh, register them. There were a lot of kind of informatics problems to actually uh, registering and building a model of the data. 
And now, and, and then once we had basically this sparse collection, then the idea is, is, then I could take one of these guys, like the guy that maybe lights up the ellipsoid body, and then I can do another genetic trick, um, <clears throat> which is to, to, to uh, 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 um, uh, basically, uh, oh my goodness, I forgot what's the name of the flipper, um, Cre Crelox. Yes. Uh, yeah, I do a... a so uh, uh, we could. So there's basically another genetic trick where you can basically take something, and you can stochastically flip a coin to decide whether to turn it on or not. Okay, Crelox. Sorry about that. And you can do it under. You can actually do it under uh, specific conditions like heat shock. And so what we did is we took the thing that basically, for example, where we had the promoter construct that would light up this particular thing, and then we added a cassette to decide whether or not it would turn on at very low probability. So we would, we would turn on a neuron in that subset already. It's already a subset of the 20,000 and turn it on and we would get individual neurons. And as long as you get neurons spaced sparsely, so for example, this is from the optic lobe, I mean, you can basically trace the entire neuron. So for example, in this thing we can get, we can definitely get the purple, we can definitely get a model of these orange guys. They're quite, uh, this yellow guy, they're quite distinct spatially, right? And we used a little bit of coloring to try to get yield, try to get more than one neuron. Um, so we used a very kind of sparse, you know, we didn't go the full uh, Lickman approach of basically trying to do a uh, brain bow, but just we wanted a little bit of color uh, to help us basically get a higher yield. And uh, here's an even more beautiful example um, from that. But you can see that basically I can see I can see the, 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 the cell body, and then I can see the primary neuron, I can see the areas that are being jacked, and I can basically isolate those, right? And so um, basically around the time I was leaving, we had developed the infrastructure for them to basically build tracings and models of the neurons. And then at that point, um, I, 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 uh, 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 Peter uh, uh, called me um, and uh, I, uh, I moved to Germany. Um, but this is still very exciting. There's, this work is still ongoing. Uh, 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 Jerry's been giving really fantastic talks about, because we can actually see, I mean, they, they're, actually, um, they're actually able to recapitulate how eyes kind of understand flow now and what that circuit is. They basically, they found that circuit using this idea. Um, they're beginning to understand how they acquire uh, learning, how the, basically the, the learning through the, uh, 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 oh, I can't remember the name of the body. Forgive me. Uh, it's been a few years since I thought about it. But, uh, but basically, they're, they're ongoing. And so then at this point, uh, um, uh, Dresden and the Max Planck uh, beckon uh, around 2011. And um, um, okay, and so, and, and I was asked not only to, to become a director of the society, um, but to also uh, uh, be the founding director for a, a center for systems biology that the, that the uh, Max Planck wanted to start. And so what was the concept and why was Dresden chosen for this center? And I want to do kind of a little background. So if you don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about the center, a little promotional, and then I'll get back to talking about stuff you're probably more interested in. Okay. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the Max Planck Institute for Cell Biology and Genetics, which is the institute that I joined, their, their mission has been basically to understand how collections of cells coordinate their activities to produce tissues, all right? So basically to understand, in some sense, development, um, the developmental repertoire at the cellular level. And part of the reason I came, I, I was really very attracted to this, is this is actually really the question that I wanted, that I was interested in, and the activity that I was interested in back in 2003. So I made this diversion to look at, at neurons, okay, which I, uh, honestly, no, no offense to the, to the uh, um, parabiologists, but uh, they're, they're fascinating, but they're a very special form of development. And I'm interested in brains in terms of development, okay, um, as opposed to function, because how do they, how do you make a brain? I mean, it's pretty incredible. How does this thing grow? Um, and uh, uh, so that was their mission. And the, the way they were basically approaching it, which was quite novel back in 98 at the time, and, and this is really, I think, true of any kind of scientific endeavor, is that, you know, they wanted to do a certain number of experiments, and they chose as their medium of, of experimenting and interrogating their systems a primary mechanism to be microscopy and transgenics, exactly the thing I've been talking about, about building transgenic constructs and then watching them in vivo or in situ, okay? 
And then to basically, and then they would have to interpret these results, image analysis. So, so these guys immediately had an image analysis problem, which is why I, I and I saw that, and that's when I first saw that, okay? It's like, it, they need help, okay? <laughs> and then, and then they, um, and then once you have actually, once you've turned your experiment into a collection of numbers and a model, something that you can, you can, you can quantitate and look at, then you can think about a hypothesis and you can model and simulate that hypothesis. So this is, this is a general pipeline. Um, and basically the way they solved this problem is that basically at the time they used the best microscopes on the market. Okay, which was at, in 1998, you know, they were buying stuff that a lot of people other didn't have. Um, and so it was a competitive edge, right? Because, I mean, as, a, as an experimentalist, I mean, what is your competitive edge? I mean, your competitive edge are your tools, right? Your competitive edge is, your, is, is, the, is having clever means to investigate the thing. If you're using the same toolkit that everybody else has, right, then the only competitive edge is that maybe you picked a better target. Okay, maybe you picked a better organism, okay? But otherwise, you're on an even playing field, right? But if you've got better tech, and you've got the latest and greatest way to interrogate something, then you've got an edge, right? And also, basically, if you've got people that can interpret what that tech is saying, right, then you've got an edge, right? So I always think about these things in terms of, of tactics, right? And so, and then, and then for image analysis, they were, they, there they were suffering. They were kind of best commercial available, which wasn't great. Or they had a student, you know, some poor postdoc, okay, spending hours, you know, tracing. You know, I looked at that microtubule one. There was some poor guy that was spending 20 minutes on every microtubule, you know. And I was just sitting there thinking, oh, man, okay. Um, so that was one of the first problems I solved. And that postdoc to this day loves me, okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, I saved him a lot of drudgery, but 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 at the time, okay, this, so this is still back in 1998, and that's what those guys were doing. And then um, in 2003, um, basically what they did is they made a very interesting move, which is they brought in basically a, a biophysicist and a theoretical physicist. In other words, they went interdisciplinary. Okay, they didn't go to computer science or bioinformatics; they went to physics, and they brought in these two guys. Okay, and suddenly. This part of their agenda got really strong, okay? I mean, because they had, you know, they had people who could really think about creating models, thinking about, you know, complex systems of differential equations, right? I mean, I'm a computer scientist. I'm kind of close to them, but my eyes still kind of glaze over, okay, sometimes when I look at those equations, right? But those guys dig it, okay? And so they're like, they're like in there, and you need that. Okay, because I mean, basically, a cell is an active 2D gel, right? I mean, you got to be able to, you know, uh, uh, and so they, so, so they became very quantitative, and that made them very powerful. And it, I won't have time to tell you, but it resulted in a lot of very interesting findings. And I really like the nature of the findings, which is another reason why I wanted to go there. And so basically, the Max Planck said, "Hey, these guys are doing pretty interesting stuff, and it's quantitative, okay, with these guys." And so in 2009, they said, "Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna fund this center." Okay, and it, it, and that we so we uh, and now our tagline is where computer science and physics meet biology, right? In, in this internet age, you have to have a tagline. Okay, so so basically, um, we we've uh, uh, they they started. I came in 2012. Uh, I was recruited in 2012 to kind of try to get this show off the ground. Although the other pieces were in place. And uh, basically, we built a building, and finally in 2017, just last year. The building was realized. Um, it's a dry building. Um, it's an adjunct to the <clears throat> to the center. So this is the this is the the original institute. This is the new center building. It, it was uh, built by a Finnish architect. Uh, he really did a rather nice job of it. I thought it's quite. Uh, I I enjoy the building. Um, it's basically a, a, a dry building, but I did try to put some, you know, I wanted to put a little something special in there. So we actually do have S1 optic suites, so I can do all of the microscopy that I want. We have actually a virtual reality cave, an immersion virtual reality cave, and then we have the obligatory uh, uh, IT infrastructure room. Um, so what was the concept then? So I said, look, it worked great, right? I mean, you took, you took these guys and you made them really, really powerful by by bringing in high-powered experts who really wanted to work with them on this question to help them in terms of the modeling, right? So there's a very tight coupling. So I said, well, let's just do the same thing. Let's bring in somebody who's really great 
at doing computer simulations. Because if you kind of produce a model in one of these systems of differential equations, you want to know if it recapitulates, right, what you think the experiments do. So you could do an in silico really condition. How about we get bring somebody in who can really do computer vision, okay, who can actually do this part and do the bioinformatic interpretations. And let's bring in somebody who can really give them an even greater edge, okay, over buying the, you know, the best Zeiss or like a, a, a microscope. And also, let's bring in the, all these facets of automation. So the idea, so really kind of my concept of the center is not to bring in kind of groups with their own agenda, but to really kind of, how should one say, bring in technologists and uh, uh, theorists who are, who are very interested in this central question, okay? And, and in fact, we have an informal, uh, it's part of our informal culture that everybody in the building has to work with at least two experimental groups across the way, has to have at least two active projects, okay? That's kind of a, an informal condition. We don't actually like police it, but, but everybody on the way in has to understand that, that if you sit in your office and you don't talk to anybody, you don't, you don't, you, that's not what we want. Okay, um, so, um, so that in, in essence is, is kind of the way I, I put together the, the center so that really what we have is, is the issue. We not, so we haven't changed the agenda really of the Institute. We've just hopefully made it bigger, okay, um, by making it truly um, uh, interdisciplinary. Um, okay, so let me, so, um, uh, so kind of uh, from, a, from a higher level, I mean, why, why is interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity interesting, right? Because we, we all talk about it, right? I mean, it's all, it's very popular, right? But the, the question is, do you really do it, right? I mean, you gotta, you gotta walk your talk, right, okay? So here's an example where it really, it really worked, okay? So here's the biologist, the lovely Suzanne Eaton, okay? And she works on fly wings, and she's very interested in uh, basically the uh, uh, cell polarity in the fly wings. So the cells have a notion of direction, okay, if you don't know. And the, these little bars are supposed to show the direction. And the, the first kind of simple question that she was after is, is, you know, as this fly wing is developing, this is about halfway through the process, the direction is basically um, a, a away from the central wing axis. But by the end of it, basically, it's along the axis of the wing. And the question was like, how did that happen? So they knew what molecules were involved, and they knew how the molecules interacted. So they had the um, interaction network of the molecules. They knew which molecules wanted to hang out together, which ones didn't. Okay, so they had a had a fairly simple model. But the question is like, how did that happen? Right. Well, what happened? There was no there was no molecular determinant of this. There was nothing, you know, there was no gradient, there was nothing that would, would seem to imply this. So how did this happen? And so enter the, the physicist, okay? So they were interested in this. So they teamed up to, to work on this question, okay? And the, the answer was that basically, as the cells flow towards the hinge, so there's a hinge here, I'm sorry my, my slide doesn't show it, but basically there's something that's pulling the cells this way, okay, and as they and as they get pulled, they're basically constantly remodeling their interactions with the cells around them, and it's that remodeling of the cells that allows this 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 molecular orientation to to change, okay, to change, and, and actually induces it to change along the axis, okay. So we won't go into the mechanics. What I find kind of more, and that what I want to convey is the approach. Okay, because the approach I think is interesting um, because it was basically all based on simulation. So what they did is they took the latest and greatest spinning confocal at the time and they basically managed to start producing these beautiful movies of the, of the fly wing uh, developing and they had, it's ECAD stained so that basically every cell boundary is stained. So that's what you're seeing and it's a little too far out for you to see it, but you can see going. And here's the amazing thing, what they did is they basically extracted a computer model. So at every time point, they found every single cell and its boundary, and they made a, they made a, they made a computer model. They extracted a computer model, okay, so there you're zoomed in, of all the cells and their boundaries. And then what they did is they took what they knew about the, about the molecules involved in giving this, this, the, the orientation signature, and they took a simple model of that, overlaid it with this 
extraction of the, of the physical process. And lo and behold, the thing remodeled itself correctly. And then by studying, okay, the overlay, they were able to actually give a clear explanation of what aspect of the reorientation of the cells was inducing the change. So, I mean, that's kind of an interesting approach, right? I mean, there was no, there was no kind of experiment, right? I mean, it was like, it was like basically let's build a really complex model and then do it. Now, here's the thing, okay? So this was, a, this was a really cool thing, and it was Frank that was able to kind of like study this, right? So Suzanne basically came in, had the fly wing, basically set up the, you know, all of the, the acquisition conditions and the, all of the transgenics, okay, provided the model, but it was, it, it, and then it was Frank, like looking at these movies and thinking about what was going on, who actually built the model and did the simulation, okay, and, 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 and eventually came up with a physical model. Although actually, Suzanne actually is also a mathematician uh, by, by training. So here's the thing. Um, so then, how long did this take them? Okay, well, it took them basically two years to produce the first one. And once they had done that, they had a process where basically it would take them one month to build a, one of these models. So you take a movie with 280 frames and it would take them one month of human annotation to get a model that was good enough to annotate. So, Okay, more interdisciplinary, okay, you put the computer guy in the middle, and that goes down to less than three days, okay? Because that's my thing, right? My thing is fast, okay, all right, accurate, okay? So, so now, I mean, think about the throughput. So order of magnitude greater throughput on experiments, because obviously they're going to want to do this, right? They're going to want to study now perturbations, okay? And we actually, we're, we're on our way towards a day, okay? All right, so that's an example of interdisciplinary. So there was Frank, and then there was me, and then there was this really great guy uh, who does simulation. As I said, simulation was important. Um, we've now got a flurry of junior groups kind of now that the building's there, and, uh, um, um, and we even have one more coming. So that, that I'm really quite happy that the center's there. And I, and I kind of circulate everybody, because you see here's the, here's the computer guy, here's the physicist, here's the simulation guy, and these guys, okay, are kind of, I, I, I'm not, I don't have time to describe each one of them, but I put them kind of where they fit on this circle between the guys, right? So I think that's the other way that you want to build a, a, a faculty, right, is my kind of my idea. So you want to have, you want to have people that aren't doing exactly the same thing, but you want to have people that have synergies with each other, right? And you want the whole thing to make a really nice synergistic network, okay? Um, and the, how you do that, I mean, hell, I don't know. Okay, but we, I'm pretty happy with, with the, with the uh, result that we got. So I guess, uh, all right, so, so back to me and a, a little bit uh, back into the scientific thing. So where do I fit on this spectrum? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a pretty good computer vision guy these days after my stay at Genalia. And um, when I came to the Max Planck, I realized that one of the things I could do with the generous budget that the Max Planck provides me is, is I could really get further into and develop uh, optical microscopes. And I'll tell you a little bit about that story. So that's kind of, that's kind of where I sit. Um, and what I'm interested in is this idea of building digital atlases of worms, of, you know, I talked about the fly brain, um, and annotate these with molecular information. Uh, okay, so, um, sorry. Um, so one of them, one of the easiest ones, or, well, I thought it was going to be easy, and I had actually started this a little bit before I got to the Max Planck, was I wanted to do basically single cell analysis of worms. And what's cool about worms is, is that since they're so stereotypic in terms of their development, right, you can basically take an in-situ worm, right, and at least if you're John Salston, you can sit there and say, oh, yeah, that's that, that's, you can, you can name every cell, right? So... When a, you know, for example, a, a C. elegans, when it, when it first uh, uh, hatches as an L1 larva, when it first comes out in this little worm, it has exactly 558 cells, okay, I think it's 558, and they're always the same, okay, and, they always, and they're roughly in the same position, okay, although I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But they're in a stereotypic enough position that a human being, like John Salston, can do it. Okay, now I naively thought that every worm biologist could do it, but no, they cannot, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, and so that was one of the first problems. So, so we basically collected a collection of 50 kind of in situ worms, took, you know, the best kind of cockfocal micro mic microscopy we could of it. And then the idea was, okay, can I solve this problem of taking a worm that I've never seen before 
in actually kind of identifying every cell in it. Because if I could do that, then I can do single cell analyses, right? Transcriptional analyses, right? Because I know every single cell. I know where the construct is expressing um, because of, of, the, of the nature. So the first thing is to basically build a model to basically segment every single cell, okay? And then uh, uh, basically against a tree to basically then identify and name every single one of them. Okay, so you want an automatic readout of, uh, uh, of every cell and, and ultimately uh, a, a readout of the, uh, say, a nuclear localized transgenic construct. Um, so I, I, I've also kind of called this the, the Salston in a box project, right? Because the idea is to basically do what John can do, okay, automatically. And uh, it, it, at first I thought it was mostly gonna be kind of a, an exercise for me, but then I realized that, wait a minute, this actually would probably be of significant value to uh, a worm biologist because they can't do it all. You know, you know I, I, I go I talk to Corey Bargman at Rockefeller. Corey can identify all the neurons, but you can't do the rest of it, okay? So what do you find is you find each domain expert is kind of learned to become a human AI for labeling diners, but they can't do, they can't do the rest of it. There's, there's only one person in the world, I think, who can do them all. Um, okay, or there was. Um, so you must segment and identify every cell. And before I came to the Max Planck, I had done this once, and we had, we, we had gotten to a pretty good point. I mean, we, and in particular, we had an atlas. We actually had a collection of, 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 of digital models of worms, straightened worms, okay, where we basically knew where every cell was. And it's interesting. I mean, every cell is basically, after kind of normalization, it is again in the same place, about plus or minus a half a, a, a nuclear diameter, every nucleus, okay? So, but we couldn't, but, we, but, 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 but when, we took, when we took our model and we took a, 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 an image that we had never seen before and we tried to line them up, you know, find some kind of matching between them, and I won't bore you with that, but that's kind of a cool problem, bipartite matching problem. Um, we were only getting like a 75% ID rate. It wasn't very good, it's like, oh. You know, and I was kind of like, well, we can't really do the thing, project with that. So when I, when I, when I got to the Max Planck, I found a very gifted um, uh, uh, computer vision person, uh, Dagmar uh, Kahnmuller, who you saw on the last slide, I mean, a COPA. And I had always had this idea that, you know, the worm is basically three cell layers. It's very simple, but it's basically an outer exoderm, a kind of a level, a, a, a mesoderm, and then an endoderm. It's like three concentric layers of cells. It's a fairly simple little creature. And the thing is, is that even though the thing's dead, when it curls up, those things move with respect to each other. The three layers move with respect to each other. And so we did a very simple thing. We basically looked at all of the models that we had, and we did what's called a principal component analysis to understand what the major axes of movement or variation were between the 50 models that we had. And lo and behold, the first two eigenvectors, the first two principal motions were exactly this movement of the, of the cell layers with respect to each other, okay? Kind of nice confirmation that the thing is basically three layers, okay? And, but what that led us then to believe from a modeling perspective is that when we do the matching, when we do the matching between our model and a, and a, new, and a new sample, what we need to do is we need to, we need to let be a free parameter, the movement of these things. So we, so we have a model now where we have kind of the location of all the neurons, but we also have two kind of free parameters that allow the three, layer, the, the three layers to move with respect to it. And so the problem then is to find a matching um, that optimizes and, uh, uh, certain things subject to these two parameters that we, can, that, we can, that we can adjust. And when we do that, okay, we suddenly were in a much better uh, situation. We were up to 92%. <clears throat> Okay, which I thought was pretty good. I mean, usually above 90, you say good enough to go, okay? Um, although I'm a perfectionist, that's still not good enough for me, okay? So that was actually a significant achievement, but I'm still not really kind of ready to go high throughput because I think I can get a lot higher. But why can't I do any better than that, okay? Why, is, why did I only get that, okay? And the answer is that there's an area around the, the pharynx here where there are lots of very small neurons, very, very small, okay? And with the microscopy that we have, you cannot sufficiently resolve them. And so almost all of the problems are basically in the segmentation, in other words, in the identification of the objects because they're not clear enough, okay? 
and we still want to do this thing. So basically the problem there, further improvement is limited by microscopy. Okay, and you're going to see this is going to be a story. Okay, so for every problem that I'm going to talk about, there comes a point where we've taken it as far as we can with the software, and to do any better, I need a better image, period. Okay, <laughs> and, and that, I mean, just to cut to the chase, just in case I run out of time, that's why I got into microscopy, okay? It, I'm not a physicist, okay? I have no right being anywhere near, okay, a laser, okay? But um, uh, uh, it, it was an act of, it's an act of desperation, right? Is, is that I, is I have to move the optical technology, okay, if I want to solve some of these problems at the global level, right? I mean, I could just say, say, hey man, I'm, I'm done. I'm a computer scientist, I'm done, but, but you know, as a Max Planck director, I don't think I'm allowed to say that. So <laughs> I think I have, to, I, have to try to, I have to try to solve the original mission, right? So let me, let me, so I'm gonna, um, so I'm gonna, uh, well, I wonder if I should do this bit. So, okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit technical here. So, I mean, basically there are two problems in computer vision. One is basically called segmentation. And segmentation is about finding the object. So here's a um, <clears throat> zebrafish embryo, and it's beginning to form its spine. And so these somites are the individual vertebrae. And the problem that um, David Richmond faced was to basically actually segment and find each one of these soma in this DIC image, right? That's a very tricky problem. He did really a beautiful job. But I'm giving it to you really just as an example of find the object, okay? That, and that can be quite hard, okay? The other thing that you want to do oftentimes is you want to follow the object in a movie. So here's basically the centrosomes during a the first few cell divisions of a C. elegans uh, embryo. And uh, basically, Stefan Jensch did a wonderful piece of work where basically he, fought, he was able to track these out to the, um, after, through the first four divisions. And we did this basically because we wanted to track the size of the centrosome. And uh, what, we, what we got from that basically, uh, after quite a bit of work and a, a huge number of variances, is that there, there is indeed a limit there's a, basically the centrosome is materially limited. And in every division, the centrosomes are getting smaller because there's no transcription, so there's no production of material, and the centrosomes are getting smaller with each division. And it's exactly showed that there was mass conservation, but it was mass conservation in one particular protein, SPD5, okay? All right, so, so you see, we can't, we can't help your biology, okay? Um, so, so, so what are the problems then? So, so the, the, the biggest problem with the stuff that most people done is, is that the way they do this is that first they find the objects and then they try to find a tracking of the objects. And if you think about it, if you made a mistake in segmenting the objects, right, then your tracking's gonna go downhill, right? Because you don't have the, you don't have the right collection of objects to be tracking amongst anyway, right? And so the problem is, and in fact, it's worse than just kind of it, it, it suffers. It's kind of, there seems to be an exponential collapse, right? If the, if the segmentation gets too far away, then the tracking is just garbage, okay, after a while. So the, the error rate, right, that 92% is actually really pretty, pretty damn good, okay? Um, so, so and, and that's what most people do, because that's kind of what makes logical sense, right? What you'd like to do intellectually is you would like to segment and track at the same time because they inform each other, right? They, they naturally inform each other. So we tried that, okay? What's the problem? You get very complex formulations, okay? It's not easy to formulate, okay? And then when we formulated these problems, they were so complicated that they were typically numerically unstable, or they had, they had a tendency towards being unstable. And they took just gunkwads of compute time too, okay, not, not to mention. And so, I mean, maybe that was our limitation. Okay, maybe somebody can do it, but we, we, we suffered and, and it, didn't, it, it didn't really go for us. So, so what we've come on, and, and this is kind of, and, and in fact, this, I think this, is, this has been working so well that, that, that uh, I'm gonna, we're pursuing it uh, en masse, is that what you do is, is that, you know, oftentimes the problem is you're segmenting and you're looking at something and you're saying, I can't tell whether that's one or whether that's two. Okay, you know, is it, you know, I've got two nuclei and maybe they're like really stuck together like this. Okay, they're too close. And so rather than say it's one or two, I'm gonna say it could be either. I'm gonna keep both of those as hypotheses. Could be one, could be two. 
Okay? So what I do is, is instead of segmenting the thing and saying it's that and that and that and that, I'm going to say, here are the space of things that could be. Okay? Now, it's not going to be everything, okay? but I'm going to kind of find everything that reasonably could be okay? or is plausible. Okay? And then I'm going to try to find a tracking amongst those things. And while I'm finding that tracking, I'm going to eliminate things until I'm going to take the plausible models that give me the best tracking. Okay, and I'm going to do it with a technique, a constraint system technique called interlinear programs. I won't bother you with it. So I think I'm going to take too long, but these are basically E. coli that are growing in a in a in a micro chamber. It's kind of a cool thing. These are called mother machines, and you can basically see them dividing. And then basically there's a there's a flow, there's a fluid flow going across the top, and they basically just eject and flow out. But you can basically do long-term monitoring of the E. coli and watch things happening. And, um, and so this is a very simple problem, right? We started with this one because it's a one-dimensional tracking problem, right? All I really have to do is figure out where's, where does one cell begin and the next begin. I just need to find the boundaries along this two, right, of where, where the guts are. So it's a very simple segmentation problem. So we, we basically, we build a, a, I won't really bore you, but we, uh, we use a number of techniques to basically come up with a collection of hypotheses. So here's a single time point and we say, look, these are the possibilities, right? This could be a cell, this could be a cell, or it could be these two. This thing could be a cell, or it could be two cells, and this one here, it could also be two cells. Okay, that's my set of hypotheses, and they're actually hierarchical. And then what we do, basically, is we say, okay, what I'm going to do is, this is, this is going to be a little bit mathematical, this is as mathematical as I'm going to get. I'm going to hopefully keep it really simple, okay, so everybody understands. So the idea is I introduce a variable, okay, that can take the value zero or one. And I introduce that variable for every single one of these possible hypotheses. So every hypothesis has a, has a variable that can be zero, I'm not real, or one, I am real. And we haven't decided. We're gonna to have to decide, is it zero or one, okay? And what we do then is we create a collection of equations that basically make sure that at the end of the day, right, any real solution you have to have a partition, right? So if you look at this cluster, for example, so I've shown you there are five variables. If you pick H1, right, then H2, H3, H4, and H5 have to be zero, right? If you pick, for example, H5, right, then H3 has to be zero, H4 has to be zero, or H4 has to be one, actually, and so on. And so you can do that by having these little simple equations. For example, this equation, H1 plus H3 plus H5 equals one. Well, think about it. The variables can be either zero or one. So how do I get to one? I, only one of those three variables can be one, right? And satisfy the equation. And at least one of them must be one, right? So this little set of three equations here basically says that I have to pick a partitioning of this part of the solution. You see how I'm doing it? Okay, and so it's really nice because you can kind of come up, it's, it's a constraint system. Then what we do is we take the hypotheses for every time point, and then we start building potential tracks between them. So we say, you know, this could become this, okay, at the next time point. This guy could become this guy. This guy could become that guy, and so on, and we keep putting those in. This guy here at the top, this guy could exit in the next time frame. So we have an exit move, okay? And you just think about the moves, and the only other move is you could divide. So this guy could divide and become these two guys in the next frame. So those are the moves. Those are the possible tracking <coughs> moves, right? And we basically put in every move that seems plausible. We don't have to actually, you know, say this is it. We just take everything that seems, this could correspond to that, okay? And we put in all these, so we put in all these potential moves, okay? Then all we have to do is basically have something, so we introduce, and then <clears throat> what has to be true of a tracking? So for example, this cell, if, 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 if we're gonna pick, for example, this particular cell, then we want one thing coming in, right? I mean, it can't, you can't have it mapped from two different things. It's one thing coming in, and you want one thing coming out, right? That's, that's all you want, that, that makes it a tracking. So we basically put in equations that say that. One in, one out, and I'm, I'm not gonna belabor the equation, okay? And then all you have to do then is have kind of a scoring function that says, well, how good is this? How likely is this, okay? And just, I'll give you a real quick example. So we say, okay, for the move, for the, you know, I go, I, I, I go from here to here over time, but what do we know about what happens to a cell? 
we know that typically it's going to move upwards, right? Because the guys below it are pushing it up, okay? And we know that um, it's going to get bigger because it's growing, okay? All right. So we look at we look at the changes, like how much up to go up and how much how much did it increase in size, okay? And here's the here's the amazing thing. So, so now I need to assign a cost function to that, okay? How good is that as a, as a move? And all you need is a cost function that's roughly correct. So we just sat there and we just said, okay, look, if this guy is in some kind of modest range between zero and 10, I don't know what the units are. If it goes backwards, in other words, if the cell moves down, okay, or if the cell shrinks, okay, we don't like that at all. So I very quickly penalize it strongly, saying, uh -uh, no, you can't go backwards. Okay, you can't get smaller. Maybe a little, but not a lot, right? And then if it, if, but then if it moves a little bit further than necessary or it gets a little bigger, then we start to penalize that, but not nearly as quickly. And we just made up that curve, okay? And I'll come back, okay? We just made that up. No, no measurements at all, we just made it up, okay? Said it's gotta be reasonable. And then what we do is, is we use this solver to say, hey, given those numbers, which are basically a reflection of the likelihood that the thing happens, give me the most likely solution, and voila, a tracking emerges, okay? What's amazing is that with that cost function, which we really hardly spent any time on, but was kind of correct in feature, we get great trackings, just right out of the box, okay? So here's an example of a real result, right, where you can basically see all of the moves, okay? Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to skip this because uh, I'm running. I'm running out of time, right? I need to. I need to get to the end. So we actually now. Uh, so I showed it. I showed it to you in detail in 1D. Okay. We've used it for 2D now. Okay. And the, and for 2D, the one thing you have to do is these are these are um, nuclei on the surface of an embryo. Is it? Let's play it again. Okay. You have to account for flow. So notice that these things are moving. Okay, that's the data. Oh, okay. All right, and then, sorry, I'm not sure about my animation here. And then you have to account, so you notice that it's moving, so you have to account for the flow. So we, so the one addition we needed is we needed a, what was called a flow algorithm where we compute the flow field so we know how things are moving in general so that we can actually make it look like they're stationary and we can understand the constraints. And then we can actually do the tracking. And even despite the fact that these things are dividing, right, so you can see them bundle up, okay, it's perfect, okay? It's like, so we're really, we've been really pleased with this. And in fact, we've now more recently done it in 3D. So this is an entire soft embryo, okay? And uh, uh, it's, it's a very good uh, solution. On the other hand, these things are never perfect, okay? Uh, and they make mistakes, okay? So you, the other kind of take-home lesson is if you're gonna get into this business, you've got to build tools for curating the results. It's just as important. And in fact, people spend a lot of time curating the results. So we're trying to give you a result that out of the box is as good as possible. And we're getting you know stronger method, stronger technique gets better. But here's an example where, the, where our, our 1D tracker completely blew it, right? I mean, here you can see it missed that cell for some reason or another. This, it thought this guy disappeared when in fact it's still there. Okay, I'm not sure why it went so far out. I mean, this guy, goes downward and, uh, okay. So, but what's really cool is think, if you think about it in the background, I have this set of equations, right, that, that constrain what the answer is, okay? So how do I curate this situation? Very simple, uh, there, there are actually 13 mistakes, okay, by my count, how do, I, how do I do this? What I do is I do a very simple thing, I say, hey, look here, here, buddy, there aren't four cells, there are five cells. Okay, and I can, in, in, in that little equation language, I can put in a little equation that says five, okay? All right, has to equal five, okay? And then I can resolve, I can then I can, I can rerun the solver. It fixes 11 mistakes, okay, with one keystroke. I call that leveraged editing, okay? And that's the way every system should be, okay? And if your computer guy gives you a system that isn't leveraged, tell him to please help you, okay? Um, and so one, one input fixes 11 mistakes, okay? And this, this basically, we worked with a group. I mean, this completely transformed the thing. I mean, it, it literally accelerated the curation work by a factor of 10, because they just had to sit there and, and basically put in an additional constraint. Say, no, no, there's a cell there. Oh, you missed that, okay? No, it didn't leave, okay? And that's the way you want these things. The other idea that we haven't actually uh, executed on yet is if you think about it. So we have, 
we've given you a very good kind of algorithm that gives you a first result. And we've given you now a leveraged editor where you can basically produce good stuff. What we realized is that if you use our leveraged editor and produce good stuff, this is what the computer scientists would call ground truths, okay, which is very hard to go, get by. If I had gone to somebody and said, hey, here's 50 microscope images of worms, please identify all the cells and give me the names of every single one, okay? And we'd be very likely to get anybody to do it, right? You'd look at me and go, I'm not doing that, okay, all right? On the other hand, if I give you an automated system that gets them almost right, okay, all right, and then I give you a leveraged editor, and I say, would you please curate these, okay? I'm much more likely to get this, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to, tactically, sociologically, right? And this is, and this is the, the computer guys, what we need. And once we have that, we can do something really cool, which we still haven't pulled off, but, but on our, our game plan, which is we can then build a learner that says, look at, I can look at how you're, cure, you're training things. And remember, these algorithms have some parameters. For example, I said I just used the first cost function I found. But that cost function, I could, I could tweak that, right? Maybe, maybe there's a better one than the one I did. And so what I do is I have a learner that looks at the, your ground truth and says, I want to adjust the parameters of these things so that I get this. And guess what? What that means then is that as you curate, the system gets better, okay? And I'm still hoping to pull that off because I think that'd be really cool, okay? Wouldn't you like that, a computer programmer that gets smarter? As you, as you work with it, yeah, okay, that's, that's the idea. All right, let me just real quick, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about microscopy, okay? So you saw there was the C. elegans case where basically I'm limited now because I can't separate these neurons, okay? So this is a, that was a, that was a fruit fly during embryogenesis. I mean, what I want to do there for the fruit fly is the same thing. I want to track every neuron from beginning to end, okay? Um, if you just look at it, there are 2,000, there would be, you need to sample basically every 30 seconds to keep up with the nuclei and track them. There are 2,880 time steps in the 24-hour period that it takes that for Sophila Timbrio. So if you want to follow it from beginning to end, right, you have to, you have to curate that many frames. And if you think about the error rate, if you develop an algorithm where the error rate was 99.9%, 6% of your lineages would be correct and that, right? Because it's just, it's 99.9 .9 to the 2,880. Uh, if you were 99.999%, then you get 97%. So in some sense, your performance level, this is kind of a faux argument because there, it, 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 I, I won't belabor the details for time, but in some sense, it says that, look, you've got to be really good, okay, in order to pull this off, okay? That's, that's the point. And uh, so we've been really working with microscopy. So one of the first things that we did, um, was uh, we worked with uh, uh, Philip Keller, who, who is at HHMI, uh, on basically uh, looking at a spin microscope. So spin microscopes, basically, they create light sheets. And in the, the kind of the more newer versions, you create a light sheet from two different sides. So you put in a light sheet from here and here. And then you have two detection objectives that look at it from both sides. And both of this is to try to basically minimize how far into the volume you're both projecting the sheet and looking. It helps. It halves things, right? And But the thing is, is that this device has a huge number of parameters, right? I mean, there's obviously the foci, but there's also where, you know, there's the, there's the where are you placing this, the center of the sheet. You can, you can torque the sheet left and right. Okay, the sheet, you can actually adjust it this way as well. So there's about 10 parameters, okay, for the adjustment of the sheet. And what we said is, look, what we're going to do <clears throat> is we're going to put all those parameters under galvanometric control. We're gonna we're gonna put them under right. We're gonna and we're gonna let the computer optimize the parameters. Okay. And um, the reason we did this is that, that you know making an adjustment is very hard. I mean, if you think about the operations you scope, I mean, Phillips people would sit there and basically tune the things. Okay. Try to get everything lined up. Okay. It's a scope on a table. You know, big flat table. And then they would turn it on. Right. And then they would have to come in every you know four hours in the middle of the night. Right. To basically make sure that it hadn't gone off, right? And it readjust the parameters. But what were they basing the parameters on? I mean, they have no idea what the light's doing when it interacts with a sample, right? Until you turn the microscope on, you have no idea. So your adjustments are kind of a half-assed guess anyway, okay? So we thought, no, 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 we're gonna put this under, under uh, control and these, these parameters can be different for different wavelengths of light. And the amazing thing was, and I, I won't bore you, we used, we had to kind of develop a notion of, of, of focus and, but. What we found is that oftentimes during the operation of the microscope, the, the focus was here and the sheet 
was two to three microns away. Okay, <laughs> from almost all the movies you've seen of stems, okay, the sheet isn't anywhere. I mean, it's pretty amazing it works, right? I mean, there's obviously not light, enough light energy, but you're way out, okay? And so, um, and, 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 and so, so basically this kind of represents the next step up in light sheet microscopy because it's basically it's tuned. I mean, the other really cool thing about it is that you can turn it on and go home and come back 24 hours later, okay? You don't have to come back in the middle of the night to adjust it. It's adjusting itself, okay? All right, so again, much beloved by uh, uh, Keller's postdocs. Um, so, and now we're trying to take this to yet another level. So we built one that has basically four uh, excitation uh, paths, basically. So we're actually doing multi-view at the same time. And then we've also got basically deformable mirrors on those things. So we put basically every bell and whistle you can think of. It's called the X-Wing. And um, basically, uh, uh, right now, it performs at about the level of uh, the Keller scope. At, at the level, it basically has uh, autopilot working on it. You can see this was obtained. With, here's the thing that, it, it really, the kind of the power of the group, because like I said, I'm not a card-carrying physicist. I'm a computer guy. But what can we do that the physicists can't do? although they could do it, sorry, I know some of you guys are pretty smart, um, is this thing is self-adjusting, it does eight-way fusion, it does uh, basically a, a, a neural net, an, an ISO-Z deconvolution, it's doing an image deconvolution. It's being losslessly compressed, it was being sent downstairs into the virtual reality cave, okay, and being shown to the, the minister of the state of Saxony, okay, so that he could actually walk through a Drosophila embryo in real time. <laughs> Okay, an immersive, have an immersive experience of a thing, okay? But the main thing is that is, is really, it, and it, again, it's the computer science thing. We're taking eight views, we're fusing them, we're, um, we're uh, basically uh, doing the deconvolution, the compression, everything, and sending it downstairs and reconstructing it in real time, right? And we can actually watch our stuff in real time. None of, none of this, you know, turning on the microscope, you know, getting some data and, you know, two days later looking at it. You, you turn on one of our microscopes, you see the data the instant you turn it on, okay? From the moment you turn on. We have real 3D interactive thing, okay? Um, uh, 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 and we're working basically on using adaptive optics and, and, and ideas of pattern excitation to get further because we need to get further. Um, Let's see, I think I, I, the neurobiologist might be interested in this. So when I was at, the reason I decided to actually try microscopy at all is while I was at Genalia, I actually did build one, my first one, and it was actually a success, which has emboldened me to think that maybe at least as a kind of decent engineer, I could continue to do this. So we basically built a, 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 a sectioning a multi-photon microscope that would image an entire brain, mouse brain in a week would collect 13,000 stacks automatically. It would figure out where the tissue was. It would basically do the, it would do sectioning. It would actually take a vibratome, move it over, section it. I mean, everything, it operates for eight days without interruption, okay? Basically, even if the, if the, if the, uh, 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 if the sensor, if the, um, um, the, uh, if the photomultiplier cut out for some reason, it would restart the, I mean, it's basically, like a, a smart microscope, an AI and a microscope, but it would basically collect this entire volume. And what we're able to do with this basically is to trace individual neurons all the way across the brain, even through the corpus callosum, even through the white matter. Okay, we can basically, you know, so we can understand the fine correlates at distance. And we think, we think this is interesting and the people at Genalia are continuing to view it. What we did in Genalia is we're basically, or excuse me, at, at MPG, is we're actually basically making it faster. I mean, it occurred to me that rather than building, you know, five of these things, okay, to get the throughput I want, what I could simply do is use like 16 beamlets. I have plenty of extra power on the laser, so basically I split it into 16 beams. And the simple trick is, is that if I put the beams far enough apart, then when I look at their return, their returns are basically non-interacting. I mean, yes, they, they, they spread, the return spreads, but not pragmatically that far. So we just use a, an array of 16 photomultiplier tubes, right? Uh, you can buy these commercially to basically do that. And we also have done some other things, though, because while the whole world has been going towards, I mean, this could be wrong, but I thought, you know, everybody's going towards basically clearing, right, making things super clear so that you can run basically a crappy microscope on it and get it, okay? 
And that's that's good, but I, I continue to worry about clearing. I mean, if you get rid of all the lipids, right, in something, I have no idea what's happening, okay? It, you know, I mean, I know that ultra structure is being screwed up, but I'm not sure, and I'm not sure about the medium scale structure. So I worry about that. So this is, this is an alternative. This is still high speed. This thing will still image the mouse brain now in a day, okay, or two, okay, maximum. But basically, we even went more the other way. We're using a digital photon counter. We're not even integrating, okay, so that we basically can go very deep into unclear unstained tissue, right? And the idea is to actually also be able to use ABs, which would be good for medical th things. So like if we want to image a cubic centimeter of liver tissue, we could also use this rig, okay? And, and then, you know, the ideas are it's non de scan to get more of photo and, and so on. Another kind of idea for a smart microscope is, should I, should I, can, can I take another, are you guys interested enough? Can I, can I take another five? Sorry. I, uh, um, so a smart spinning disc microscope. So here's Suzanne's flywing, okay? We've done a very good job of getting it down, but again, what's the problem? Well, the problem is the staining. It's punctate, some places it's gone, okay? It's like, you know, and, and with, the, with what we have available, okay, we're really kind of getting down to it. I mean, we're getting down to the point where a human being can't do it either, okay? And that's kind of my criterion. If a human being can't do any better in my software, then I'm at the limit. Kind of, you know, because we're great, we're great devices. In fact, we see things that aren't there, okay? I mean, which is really an interesting thing, okay? But let me get back to the point, which is in cross section, the fly wing is slightly curved, right? We're, we're actually looking for a 2D surface, a manifold, but that manifold actually is curved in space when you look at it kind of edge on. And over time, it bends even more. As it's growing, it kind of goes like this, okay? And so in order to handle that, what they do is they, they actually, I thought it was 20, but they actually collect 40 planes. So they go way above it and way below it, okay? And they collect 40 planes, and it's a spinning disc confocal. So every time you collect a plane, you're putting in the same energy into the entire volume, every part of the volume that, that, you, that you are at the, at the place that you're trying to image. So you're putting in basically a huge amount of light energy, right, to get that purple line. Okay, you're putting in 40 times more than necessary. You could just put it there. So the idea is to build a microscope that knows where the surface was. I, I know where it was the last time, right? If I can build code that's fast enough to, to run our, we have algorithms that already figure out where this plane is and do all that stuff, right? So if I can get that software on board and actually know where the thing is, right? Then instead of collecting, you know, 40 planes, I can collect three, okay? And when it's really curved, I can use a digital light processor to actually even, so I can basically substantially reduce phototox and significantly increase speed, right? And you know that how many photons you see is a function of how much energy you put in, right? And right now, not to kill the thing, right, to do those 40 planes, there's a limit on how much we put in. But now if I'm only collecting three planes, crank it up, right, okay? All right, let's get as much photonic return, right, from that, those ECAD molecules that I can. That's one thing I can do. Or if I'm having trouble following something, I can go faster, right? Because I only have to do three planes per, so you, you get the idea, right? And so uh, a very uh, a, a, a gifted uh, a PhD student, Alex Diproff, is building that thing. Um, all right, one last story, and then I'm truly done. Okay, so planarium is a really interesting creature. It's a wholly regenerative creature. You take a planarium, you divide it into 40 pieces, you come back two weeks later and you're going to have 40 planariums. Okay, all right, so it's, it's, it's completely regenerative, um, but it's full of mucus, okay? It's like really snotty, okay? And I guess maybe that's the price for living forever, okay? So you have to deal with lots of mucus, I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's not optically very clear. And the problem is, is this, this young guy, Tobias Booth, showed up and said, hey, man, I want to image, you know, I want to see where the regenerative cells are going when I wound the planarium. And I'm like, well, good luck, you know, okay, uh, and, and, uh, but I'll try to help you, okay. And this kid, this is a, this is a great kid. I mean, he, he basically, first thing he did, okay, was, okay, is he found one that was actually relatively clear that was right next door, it's a, it's a slightly different strain, but, but evolutionary, very close, same properties, completely regenerative. Okay, so good. So another guy that has the same properties. Then of course, the, the, the tissue is very, very scattering, and so any uh, optic, uh, any, re, any mismatch in the uh, uh, optical density matter, so he basically came up with this iodoxinol prep, 
uh, where you can basically, by mixing in a certain amount of iodoxinol, you can change the refractive index uh, density of the medium to basically perfectly map the creature that you've got in there at the time. And that helped. And then the last coup de gras actually came from the rest of my team. So these things are really highly photosensitive. I mean, you put a little light energy in the thing, the thing twitches. Okay, it's just that it won't, it won't sit still. You put in enough light energy to actually get a clear return, it's just, it's going crazy. To basically get it not to twitch, you have to put in about 50 times less energy than you would, you would ideally want to put in to get a, a decent photonic return from your floor force. And so basically, we used uh, basically deep neural nets, okay, to enhance signal to noise ratio, and that takes me into the last thing. So what we did is we basically, we took a planarium um, that was uh, in situ, that was dead, okay, and we basically imaged it at high power, okay, to get a really good image. And um, actually, before we did it at high power, we did it at the power that we wanted to image it at. So this is the amount of power we, we can put in and not have the thing twitch. And this is what you get back if you put in that much energy. If you put in the energy you want, this is what you get. But if you think about it, because of things in situ, we can generate as many of these as we want. So we generated a whole bunch of these pairs, okay, of stacks, where we had the low light stack and we had the corresponding high energy stack, right? And the thing's in situ, so it's not moving. So we know they're perfectly correct. Then we took, you know, the popular, there's now there's everybody's using deep nets. So we took a, what's called a deep U net, okay, and we trained it on this thing, okay. And, um, and that was the trick, right? The main trick was to figure out how to get the training data. Because in microscopy, where do you get training data? It's easy for Google, right? They've all got you doing CAPTCHAs, right? To tell, to tell them that they're, you're not a robot, okay? What they're really doing with that stuff is they're using it as training data. Okay, for their for their uh, for their deep nets. Okay, but basically there you go. I mean, looks good, right? So, so uh, you can and then a little bit zoomed in. Um, so I mean, and we, this paper is about to come out. Nature methods. Um, and so what you're looking at is the first um, uh, uh, ever movie of a of a planarium. I mean, so the 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 youngster did it. I mean, I I, I give him a lot of the credit. Um, We've done a lot of work with these deep nets, actually. We've, um, and this, this paper, I mean, I, I actually, I'm gonna give a little promotion for this paper because I think, I actually think it's gonna be probably, I'm hoping it's gonna be a more influential piece than anything I've done with a microscope because it's really, it's, it's really stupendous what we've been able to do. I mean, you know, you know that one of the classic problems in microscopy is, is that you get good lateral resolution you know, an X and Y looks great, but, but in, 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 in the lateral arches, because of the shape of the point spread function, you tend to get this, right? And that's exactly the problem we have with the worm. So by simply using one of these nets, and I, won't, I, won't, I don't have time really to tell you how we train the net, but we've basically been able to do a net where this is the result. In other words, this is the correspondent. And basically we do it by training, we, we end up by, by using the lateral data to basically we fake uh, 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 ground truth data. So, and this is kind of like the result of this, and you can, I'll just let you see a little bit of it, but you can see it looks quite nice, okay? And we can even do ultrastructure, okay? So this is, this is basically a wide field. This was the wide field input. This is our reconstruction, and then this is the, the uh, empirical observation by SRRF. But, you know, this took 20 images to produce. This was one wide field image, okay? And so you can see even this thing's bleaching, okay, because of how the sample is going to modulate the light, the, the, all the optical refractive index mismatches. And given a model of the fluorescence, we can basically reconstruct what a, what a given microscope would see. And we figured that's going to be a very interesting potential for training, because if you think about it with a simulator, we can generate as much ground truth as we want, as long as it's reasonable. And so we're, we're looking at that with respect to our device. So to conclude, finally, uh, sorry, is the, the vision basically is I, I'm calling kind of what I'm doing computational optics because it's not, it's not really the traditional thing. And the, I mean, if you think about it, it, it a microscope is, is it's just not a device that simply captures images anymore. You know, it's not a thing you look through and, okay, it's, I mean, it's got a digital camera. It's, it's basically, it's more a device that basically, the way I like to think of it is it's a light interrogation device, right? You can basically create lasers and light and you can basically put light energy into your sample in a whole variety of ways, right? 
And then you get a return, and then you measure the photonic return in any one of a number of ways, okay? So you have a light device, a light interrogation device. You then basically take the results of that interrogation, and you, I'm just calling it deconvolution, right, to suggest that basically it's the convolution, it's the computation you do to reconstruct whatever it is you're after, the fluorescence density or whatever it is you want the microscope to produce, right? And then given the reconstruction, you can then, under robotic control, modulate what the light device does, right? I mean, so this, is, this was the autopilot. There was an immediate feedback, okay? You're basically seeing what the device is returning, and then you're saying, no, modify, right? And you can do it. And, and even more, you can basically add basically an image analyzer, something that understands what's being seen. It can understand what the cells are or where the surface of something is or whether a cell is dividing. It can basically take that information and inform the robot on what it would like the microscope to do. So if you think about it, really, microscopes are becoming really robotic devices and that aspect of them and light interrogation devices, okay? And those aspects, and all of those things really in some sense well, there's the aspect of basically laying all of the catalog parts onto the table, okay, and putting them together in an interesting combination. A lot of it is computing, right? Is computing the deconvolution, you know, writing the real-time controller to do the robotic part, right? Writing the bioimaging analysis software to understand what the scene is, right? Which is why I think there's room for somebody like me in the field, or maybe I'm just making up a reason for why I could be into it, but it's all about computing, okay? Anyway, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay.